Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora tato. Um, my name's David Galler from Counties, my colleague Rob. Um, it's a great honour to be here today and we're grateful to the organisers for allowing us this spot. This session's entitled Climate Change and Health, Why It's Our Business Too, and I know that Rob and I feel similarly that perhaps other organisations are leaving us behind when it comes to stepping up into the space and it's really time for the ASMS to, um, to do the same. So what we're going to do today is give you some background and context why a focus on greenhouse gas uh, emissions and a reduction in them should be core business for the ASMS, and suggest some specific actions for uh, the association to support. Um, in particular, the New Zealand Medical Association statement on health and climate change, there should be a copy on every table, so at some stage it might be worth having a bit of a look at that. Those state, that statement there is very, very similar to statements made by many of the colleges uh, that you will be uh, a party to. Um, so important that um, the ASMS gets on board. Also, uh, there's a group in New Zealand called the Sustainable Health National Network, or the Sustainable Health Sector National Network, um, and, uh, that uh, is comprised from many people from the district health boards around New Zealand who are working collaboratively in the space, and we're going to talk a little bit about their work and what they're advocating for. And finally, um, Rob will talk to this issue of the true cost of travel, uh, to include the carbon cost as a reimbursable expense. So um, when it comes to healthcare, uh, this is data from the UK, and uh, that healthcare, that healthcare is probably makes up between four and ten percent of a nation's carbon footprint. It varies from country to country. Uh, in the United States, it's about ten. It's been measured in Australia. It's about seven. It's never been measured here, actually, but it's probably a little bit lower than that. We think probably about four or five percent. The, the carbon footprint itself is made up of different elements from healthcare. And if, say, for example, my district health board. Uh, ran completely on renewable energy tomorrow, we would still have a significant emission profile uh, that is related to uh, the, the carbon costs of all of those things that we use in our everyday practice, the devices and the medicines and all of those things, uh, the carbon cost of those things, the carbon cost associated with the manufacture, the packaging, the transport, the use, and the disposal of all of those uh, um, medicines and devices uh, account for up to 60% of, um, of the footprint for health. Um, interestingly, um, different from other sectors, um, there's a, a, a kind of nice double whammy when it comes to health and uh, climate change and, and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, because everything that, that's good for health is also good for the climate, and everything that's good for the climate is good for health. And um, maybe, you know, at some point, maybe before dinner or, t or at the dinner table tonight, try and think of one that isn't, <laughs> because I think you'll be hard-pressed. If you do, come and tell me, because I'm going to have to change future talks. And I'll just give you a quick example of what that is. I think prevention, okay? Prevention. Primary prevention of illness is, uh, is, is incredibly good for health. It's also incredibly good for the climate, you know, because actually pr primary prevention means we do less. We use less. We consume less. You know, primary prevention uh, is a really important thing for us to be involved in. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. That's just one example. Services closer to home, uh, you know, is another example. Low energy estates. Um, there's all sorts. What waste, the way we manage waste, all of those things. It's pretty clear to most people that um, as the world warms, there is a specific, well, there are a series of very specific and well-described threats to human health. Uh, and there's two papers here that I would refer you to. The Lancet paper uh, from, um, oh, well, when was that? It's a while ago now. Uh, and the, the Lancet paper, which really is a comprehensive review of the impact of a warming world on people, communities, countries, nations, that kind of stuff. The paper, the New Zealand Medical Journal article, a 2014 article that's cited there, is a local paper. It's written by Hayley Bennett and her colleagues, um, all members of the Health and Climate Council called Orataio. I don't know whether you know about Orataio. It would be a good thing to, for all of us to join, I think. Uh, and that paper by Hayley is uh, a really wonderfully written paper. It's comprehensive in its description of the, uh, of the impact of climate change on health, and it's incredibly well referenced. And, and uh, I would, you know, I'd be hard pressed to find another paper um, that goes into the kind of detail and referencing um, uh, of that particular paper by Hayley Bennett from uh, Rotorua. 
know, it's a funny thing, you know, when you look forward, you know, um, into the future and we think about the threats of climate change, you know, the future is kind of full of uncertainty, you know, and it can cause angst amongst all sorts of different people. How are we going to adjust, you know? And, and there are a number of ways of doing that. You can do the John Key, which way is the wind blowing today approach, and do some quick stepping. Or you can look back, because sometimes the clues to how, the clues to, how to manage the future are in the past. And this wonderful description or depiction, this concept of health and wellness for Māori by Sir Mason Dury is a wonderful um, opportunity for us to reaffirm what health and wellness really means. And it's, it, it's much more than physical health, obviously. It's a holistic vision of you know, our physical health, mental health, spiritual well-being, and the well-being of the family. And you know, it's, it's quite interesting when you look at First Nations around the world, and here's another depiction. It's a kind of complicated slide, this. And this slide is from the four great um, North American tribes of the province of British Columbia and, and Canada. And they too have a, a holistic view of what health and wellness means for their people. And it's very similar to the Māori view. But they go a step further, and I think this is the step there's two steps further, and these are the steps that I think are really important for us, the context in which to think about climate change and what's good for the climate is good for health and what's good for health is good for the climate. The two steps further are they specifically describe a constituency for that, that, that attributing health and wellness to, and that, that constituency are made up of individuals, they're made up of families, and they're made up of communities, and it's good to localise this the, the benefit that we, we, we will get to real people and to think about real people and real families and real communities. The other thing that I think is really important, and this is the really big, big step, is to recognise that, um, that, um, that, that health contributes to a higher purpose. Health care contributes to health. A lot of other things around, apart from health care contribute to health and well-being. We know that. But it's really important to understand that there is a purpose that health, everything that we're doing contributes to health. That's what we're here to do, to contribute to health and well-being. And what is health and well, and that, what, is the, what, what is it contributing to? What is that higher purpose? You know, it relates to that constituency, but the, the North American tribes of British Columbia uh, say that higher purpose relates to, those, to that constituency, individuals, families, and communities reaching their potential to flourish. In South Auckland, for many years, we've talked about the very same thing. We've subsetted it down. We've talked about um, you know, individuals, families, and communities being self-reliant, well, being well, being happy. Well is much bigger than healthy. Well and happy. And being productive and self-reliant, being able to start their own businesses and staff their own businesses. And this is the kind of interdependent system in which the work that we do sits. Every day, the thing that we do, although it may be a one-on-one -on -one and we're in a hospital or we're, we're, you know, we're in a sort of quaternary unit doing you know, something extraordinary to some tiny little part of the body, you know, <laughs> we're in a big interrelated system. And I think it's really important that we understand we're in that system and we need to sort of advocate for the well-being of all parts of that system. And I think sometimes we get lost in our own worlds and we don't do that enough. We advocate for those bits that we're directly involved with, but we need to do a little more. And you know, just thinking about you know, Charlotte's talk and the, 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 the work that we've done, uh, the, the, the association's done on looking at burnout, um, you, know, you know, this physician well-being stuff is very much related to this idea of value. This is the quadruple aim. It's up from the triple aim now. You guys are aware of the triple aim? That, that balance of you know, the, te the, the tension between the three things in a health system. It's about you know, how the people's experience of care, you know, families and individuals going to their doctors and going to the hospitals, their experience of care. Population health is another arm of the triple aim. And the third one has always been around costs or value. And traditionally, it's been seen as value for money. You know. um, this, because of the, the, the global recognition of burnout now, we're starting to look at this thing called the quadruple aim, and so the well-being of healthcare workers is now being recognised as a major problem for all of us to focus on. One of the ways that healthcare workers may benefit is to engage in this, this kind of work that we're going to talk about today, to get engaged in the whole of the system. Okay? Um, and value, which was value for money, 
is now being uh, reinterpreted as value for um, money, but also other costs, carbon costs, social costs, and also health costs. And as we see the progression of the Zero Carbon Bill go through Parliament, it's, it'll come to Parliament in, uh, in the first week of December for its first reading, and the establishment of a Climate Commission, and the Climate Commission most likely will set carbon budgets, um, and we will get a price on carbon, and carbon will become more effectively built into business as usual costings. Whoops, okay. Um, Another thing that's become pretty clear too is why we should get on board with this because it's happening is that the economic benefits to um, the world are massive. This is a, a report by the Climate Commission on the Economy and Climate in 2018 by Lord Stern who looked at if we accelerated our action uh, to become uh, net carbon neutral by 2030 as a, as a, as a, as a world, there would be something, of the, something like $26 trillion of economic benefits released. A recent report last year done in New Zealand by uh, Westpac and Vivid Economics um, said that if we get to the net carbon neutral target that the government have set, prior to 2050 there will be billions of dollars um, in value added to the New Zealand economy as well. So this is really quite a big deal. I want to talk to you about value for money because that's the old thinking. Value for money and short-term costs. Okay, who comes from the Southern District Health Board? Okay, who comes from uh, Tyrafferty here? Auckland, Waitematan counties, and I think Nelson Marlborough might be involved in this. These six district health boards carry the liability for 20 district health boards in a contract with Compass, a multinational food provider, to provide inpatient meals and, um, and meals on wheels for a staggeringly long 15 years. You know, now, our sustainability group objected to that in 2014. We got the business case. It was heavily redacted like a document from the NSA in the United States, you know. But our objection was not so much about the fact that the food was crap. It is crap, you know. It wasn't so much about the staggeringly long contract of 15 years. Who has a contract for 15 years? You know, that is just so eye-wateringly stupid. But it wasn't about that. Our objection really was about the fact that that contract cut out our local suppliers from the economy created by the largest employer in those six regions, and thereby was doing more, uh, uh, more damage to the health of our community than, than, uh, than any benefit. And that was our objection to that. That's value for money. Another value for money um, success, you know, um, the toxic mould and the, the rotten buildings at my own organisation, you know, where actually buildings are seen as short-term costs and not long-term investments. A building, the operational costs of a building over its lifespan are probably between 15 and 20 times the construction cost. Um, there is considerable evidence now that for different levels of upfront investment in green design, uh, that the operational costs uh, can be reduced significantly, and the product, the improved productivity, we talked about that this morning, Murray was talking about it, those ghastly buildings, you know, productivity goes through the roof. There's, there's actually solid evidence for that now, and maybe we could talk to the minister about that when he comes. I certainly would like to. The, the government sort of do get it. You know, they do get it. And this is, you know, uh, this is what they're doing at the moment in, in preparation for the budget 2019 using Treasury's living standards framework. You know, so it, they actually had this conversation in the run-up to the election, if you remember. You know, the economy. Oh, the economy. The economy for what? Why do we have an economy? Is it to make the rich richer and the poor poorer? Is it to make people overseas really wealthy? Or is it for everyone to do well? And I think that this is an attempt by the government to start to recognise that we need to look at different ways to reach people and to measure wellness and to look at wellness in other terms rather than just economic terms. So what we want is the ASMS to show support for that statement that's on your table, the Sustainable Health Sector National Network's advocacy, and I'm going to talk to you very briefly about that, and to include the true cost of travel, including the carbon cost as a reimbursable expense. Now, I'm going to flip over that because that's on the sheet on the table. The Sustainable Health Sector National Network have been advocating uh, to the ministers, uh, mainly Julianne Genta and um, David Parker, and also to James Shaw, these particular issues that see that the district health boards should, should work together linked up into the Certified Emission Measurement and Reduction Scheme of Environmark that eight DHBs currently belong to. Counties joined that in 2012 and have reduced our own carbon footprint by 22% since then. 
that the public sector and the, and the ministries, which form up 40% of the economy, should do the same. They should work together as a block and collaborate. That the Ministry of Health promotes and assists DHBs in this work. All DHBs need to work up a, a, an adaptation and mitigation um, plan for climate change. That could be done as a group, largely, and contextualised locally. We need to look at a new approach by the public sector to procurement, you know, to, to include life cycle assessment costs. And the recent letters of expectation from the Minister of Health to Pharmac and the DHBs have elevated the importance of these environmental concerns in a way that's never, never been done before. So we're quite well positioned. And we need to see new capital as a long-term investment, not a short-term cost, and that business plans that um, deta should detail options for upfront investment for uh, against estimated um, savings and operational costs and improve productivity over the lifespan of the building. So I'm going to hand over to Rob to get into the detail of offsetting. This is one thing that we can actually fix here and today. Uh, I assume the clap was for him. Um, Rob's my name. I'm another middle-aged bald guy with a loud shirt. Um, a couple of years ago, Clinton Pinto, Clinton's the guy who's been lying down for most of the stuff today, uh, stumbled at the finish line when we tried to introduce offsetting uh, for CME-related uh, plane fares and stuff at Middlemore a couple of years ago. It was quite depressing, and uh, we have taken a couple of years to get to the point where we can push the ASMS for support. Um, we've got a remit, which I will speak to. Um, Clinton isn't really up for that at the moment. Um, Dave's painted a, a bigger picture, uh, a kind of a more um, powerful, kind of global and inspiring kind of thing, and I'm going to talk to you about some nuts and bolts, unfortunately. Um, I think our remit may have lacked uh, ambition. But I'll stick to my remit, and I'll stick to my dry task, and I'll stick to my three slides, Dave. Uh, just to know that air travel accounts for about 3% of global CO2 emissions. So if you take a flight, you pollute CO2. Offsetting is where you pay somebody else to clean up your mess. It's quite simple, really. If you go to a restaurant and you have a nice meal and it comes on a plate and you get a proper knife and a fork and a glass and a, you know, a serviette and you eat your dinner, you pay a little bit extra, but you walk away and somebody else cleans up after you, don't they? And those plates get used again, the cutlery gets used again. Failing to offset is the same as buying a takeaway dinner, going down to the beach, and throwing the polystyrene, the cup, the plate, and the plastic bag into the ocean and leaving it for everybody else. So I think we should try to offset, okay? Uh, you could ask why we should be doing this in this country, because this country has uh, an emissions trading bill, uh, an, an act, uh, or a scheme. It's actually called the Climate Change, open brackets, Modified Emissions Trading, close brackets, Amendment Bill 2009. And it is a watered down by national, uh, or the national government, uh, version of a rather unambitious bill that was put to parliament by the, Labor, the previous Labour government. It's got three flaws, okay? Because this, this is supposed to be a cap and trade scheme. It has three flaws. It's uncapped. So it's not much of a cap and trade scheme with, with its uncapped. It has no goal. It's intensity based. So the more dirty your industry, the more likely you are to get more free credits. So if you do something dirty, you get free credits. If you do something clean, you don't get anything. So that's not going to work, is it? And there is no trading. There's no auctioning. There's no, uh, there's no driver to improve things. Uh, it's pretty pathetic. Um, the coverage is partial. It doesn't include agriculture, a big chunk of our CO2 emissions. It doesn't in include healthcare. That's us, and we're dirty. We know that. And it doesn't include travel. So it therefore subsidises these particularly intense carbon-releasing activities. When I, mean subs when I say subsidised, that's what I mean. So Treasury's figures are that by 2050, if we leave the carbon scheme as it currently is, that New Zealand taxpayer will have picked up about $100 billion worth of that problem. And industry will have picked up about 1% of that. Okay, so it's a ginormous transfer of wealth from taxpayers to industry, and it does nothing. Uh, 
All right. So there is no scheme which will clean up after our CO2 when we travel. There is a, there is a mechanism by which we can do that, and that is uh, carbon trading. And if one carbon, one tonne of CO2 is basically one carbon credit. And carbon credits are awarded to, pros, uh, to projects that either avoid greenhouse gas emissions, and that might be um, renewable energy, or it might be uh, capturing the methane from a landfill, for instance. Or two, they reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that might be uh, just creating more efficiency in, in a system. Or three, they sequester CO2, and the obvious one for that is a forest. Um, to get a carbon credit, it has to be additional to business as usual. If you build a wind farm just out there somewhere in Wellington, you're going to be making money tomorrow selling your electricity. It doesn't need any help to get going. But say you live on Stewart Island and you want to do something about your dirty diesel generator and you think, oh, we can put up a solar farm. But your solar farm's not going to make much money. There's not a lot of sunshine and there's an awful lot of cheap diesel going around. The way to make that work is to gain some carbon credits for something that otherwise would not have been financially viable. Interestingly, there is a secondary benefit to people who, at the point at which the carbon credit stuff works, of about $600 a tonne. So it's kind of thought that there's a co-benefit uh, of offsetting, and it's kind of nice to see co-benefits keep appearing through this whole sustainability kind of argument. Anyway, a legitimate carbon credit in New Zealand, and that doesn't mean Ukrainian hot air, a legitimate carbon credit gets carbon zero certification because it meets recognised standards. The project is assessed and it's approved. The credits are held in a recognised registry and the credits are retired, so they're used once only. And in New Zealand, we have the New Zealand Emissions Unit Register. There are others elsewhere. A registry must meet fundamental principles. It has to be additional to overcome these investment barriers. It has to be permanent. It has to be zero leakage. It has to be measurable. It has to be verifiable and verified. It has to be transferable and it has to be tradable. So there's no double counting. Basically, it's a stock market, not for company shares, but for carbon. I see we never hit the start button on this, so I've got no idea how long I'm taking. OK, until recently, if you bought a ticket on an Air New Zealand uh, website, you, you got three options. You paid for your ticket, and then it asked you, uh, do you want to donate to a charity, do you want a carbon offset, or do you want to do nothing? The charity was quite a good one, but everybody did nothing, really because there's no really good argument to do anything else. Things have changed now when you look at their website, you tell them where you want to go, you tell them who you are, and before you've even paid, where it asks you, would you like some insurance, do you want to rent a car, the next thing is, would you like to offset your travel? And you can do that. So Air New Zealand uses a program run by Climate Care UK, which is a for-profit registry system, which works like our NZX. Uh, Jetstar and Qantas use the Australian National Carbon Offset Standard, which is also available through their ticketing websites. And these are legitimate, approved, assessed, recognised, and the credits are retired. So you can pay for your carbon while you buy your ticket, and it's easy. It's actually pretty cheap at the moment, because carbon really only costs about 25 bucks a tonne. So for me to fly to Wellington and back from Auckland is about $5. To fly further costs more, and to fly business class costs even more. Um, but those things are worked out in the calculators on the website. So in New Zealand, for instance, if you fly to UK and back um, economy, it'll cost you about 70 bucks. And if you go business class, it'll cost you about 230 bucks. Uh, so we believe, little bullet point here, we believe that SMOs, when travelling on CME, should offset the carbon cost of their flights when purchasing a ticket. There are some caveats. Air New Zealand advertises that its footprint will max out at 2020. You might have seen some advertisements lately. Uh, and that their net emissions will reduce by 50% in 2050 on 2005 levels. Um, that's great. OK, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, but all IATA airlines, and that's the International Air Transport Association, which carries 83% of jet passengers in the world, all IATA airlines have signed up to the same thing. There's a weasel clause in there. They're talking about net emissions by 2050. And I think that means airlines accept that if they want to keep flying with kerosene and burning fuel in the sky, they are probably going to have to get into offsetting as well. Um, OK. All right. So I think we should go with Air New Zealand because they have ambition and other airlines are not quite so sure. 
I have said that we're flying using personal or CME, you should air New Zealand and you should offset as you go, and I think the ASMS should support that. I think that CO2 is an actual and reasonable cost, and it should be paid for like any other expense. In New Zealand, you can, you can offset as an organisation, and Envirmark Solutions, which is a wholly owned company by, owned by Crown Research Institute, is available to us. So it's owned by the government, it's a gold standard process, and it's ideal. They run a program called CMARS, which a lot of the DHB uses, the, the museum uses, this place uses it, I think. Uh, the zoo uses it, for goodness sake. They have customers in Europe, they have customers in the UK. They run a carbon zero program. You might see the little sticker on the side of a Virgin Couriers van, the black and yellow vans. Um, they provide mechanisms for reducing CO2 and for certification. They allow organisations to offset their emissions and they make them do better. We approached them a couple of years ago from Middlemore when we were looking at mechanisms to offset C uh, SMO CME related emissions and they were fantastic. They volunteered to bring us a calculator that would fit in with our leave forms and actually in our, um, not our leave forms, our uh, expense claims forms, which would let you do the whole thing in one go. Um, so if, if the zoo can do it and New Zealand Post can do it and everybody else can do it, the ASMS can do it, okay, we really could, we should. We believe we've been really slow as an organisation to incorporate the realities of, and the implications of climate change. We are uh, late to the table on this kind of thing. This is a public health crisis. It's a global phenomenon. It's not just us. But it's a massive opportunity to start doing better, and I think we should. Dave's talked to you about what we should be doing as a profession. I hope I've given you some of the nuts and bolts of what offsetting could mean and what it fits, how it fits within a mix of actions that we have to take. On reflection, our remit is a bit pathetic, but I think I would urge you to support it. And if you feel free, uh, you should feel free to propose something more ambitious, because I think that's what we need. Thank you, David and Rob, for that uh, thought-provoking session. Um, we do actually have maybe two minutes for questions and answers, so it'll have to be pretty snappy. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Money goes, so if you offset, the money goes to the, to the solar. Say you went with the solar farm on, say, you, say we built a solar farm on Stuart Island, and they don't have enough money to, to, to run because these was cheap. But they will get credits. They, they will get an income that you can buy, that you can pay them by offsetting your CO2. So the money, the money goes round like a stock market moves money around to the people who buy stuff and people who sell stuff. So that solar farm can now operate at a profit as opposed to not being able to, not being viable at all. So, as an example. a lot more complicated than, than probably we think and actually I suppose all of us are guilty of actually air miles anyway because actually I can think of quite a lot of conferences I go to that probably I could equally do um, at home on my computer if I had the time but I don't. I think you're right, it is complicated, but I think there are things that we can do, and this is a practical thing that we can do. I mean, many of the businesses will be um, uh, uh, certified in their own ways, with the, some with CMAR, some with other schemes, you know. The ASMS probably wouldn't be, wouldn't be a bad idea for the association to look into becoming um, certified um, with Environmark too, uh, as a, you know, to take a stand in that regard, and that may be another remit that might pop up. But I think all of us have a responsibility to contribute to this. It is a bit of a money-go-round, you're absolutely right, but, you know, and travel is, uh, is you know, what did you say, 3% of the global, global emission profile? It's, it is significant, you know, and I suppose in an ideal world we should travel less. But, you know, it's quite hard for us to travel less, but we should try. But if we do travel, at least we can do this. Unfortunately, because of time, we'll have to finish there. But thank you very much. You can, people can see that there's the formal remit is on the, on the uh, slide there. So this was what we'll be considering in formal remits later in the day or tomorrow. Thanks very much again. Thank you.
Thank you very much.